This episode, I'm sitting down with a new friend of mine. His name is Michael Miller, and he is a giant personality. I really love this guy. He's hilarious, uh, but he's got an incredible story. Uh, I first met him because they have adopted kids, and my wife and his wife got to know each other. But Michael Miller is a serial entrepreneur. He's got a background in banking, and his whole mission right now is teaching people how to become financially independent in creative ways because the models that our parents use, they don't exist right now. And so this is a great episode. I think you guys will like it. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment and enjoy this episode. Hey, this is the Money Hole Podcast. Please make sure to like, subscribe, download, and leave us a comment or ask a question. Today, I'm with my good friend, my new good friend, Michael Miller. Glad to be here. Yeah. So, Art, like, we know all the same people, it's and funny. we're crossing all these roads, and finally, we get a chance to sit down and chat. On the credit of our wives. Yes. You know, that's how it works. It's fun. Yeah. I think we've been social media friends for like a year or something. We have been. And all of a sudden, my wife's like, hey, have you ever heard of the lambs? And I was like, oh, yeah, I think so. You know? So funny. I seen you, I, I saw you at least a few times at Jason's house <clears throat> yep. and I didn't make that connection. And I just got to say, man, you got one of the sweetest wives in the whole world, man. She is incredible. Well, thank you for saying that. And I, I agree. She's, yeah. uh, she's something else, but don't let her fool you. It's not all sweet. Well, you know, it's, we, we try to too. call out the best in people. Right? Well, Hey, listen, <laughs> <laughs> she's amazing. She yeah. is definitely, you know, I know we all joke and it's cliche about, you know, batting out of your league, but I definitely think I won the wife lotto on that one. Bro, so yeah, me too. You're not but, supposed to agree so wholeheartedly, but I appreciate this. Yeah, well, you know. I, I'm in the same boat. So, <laughs> well, one of the things we have in common is adoption, which is kind of yep. what connected us. We both have adopted kids, which is an, a crazy, so crazy fun adventure. Yeah. Um, but you also you also have a very interesting background in the financial world. Moved here from to Reading from Seattle, and and now you're doing some some really cool stuff trying to help people think outside the box and figure out how to create wealth and become financially independent in a world where affordability seems out of touch for everybody, yeah. uh, interest rates are high, you know, the credit markets are tightening every day and you guys are doing some really cool stuff. So, you know, for the people that listen to this and watch this, I thought we'd get some value out of it. So That's why fun. don't we start with your background, man? So tell me a little bit about your background in banking and then what brought you to Reading. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in the bank. I mean, I started with Bank of America when I was 18, um, started as a personal banker. I worked in the retail bank. I did work in the mortgage space, um, the investment space. And my last job was a VP in the small business space um, for, for the West. And so um, long, you know, 16, 17 years with uh, Bank of America corporate background, you know, and I was mostly in the leadership space. So I, you know, a lot of people think that that immediately means that I'm like good at math or something, but yeah. that really wasn't my background. Yep. But yeah, we moved... Um, Moved to Reading about uh, seven years ago, um, just kind of, I was still working with the bank and uh, we had taken a little bit of time off to do some ministry work and some missions work and um, but came here really for business. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a business partner at the time. We had um, one of the many companies that we had kind of been a part of uh, was was located here. We're doing a lot of work here. It's a record label. And so we kind of, you know, my partner was in SoCal. We were in Seattle. We're connected to the church here. And so it just kind of, we came together and said, Hey, Red, let's make Reading our kind of next stop. And to be honest, I didn't ever think we would have been here even as long as we've been. And now we're just convinced that we may never leave. So, well, I hope you don't. Oh, me too. What me record too. label? It's called Resurgent. Resurgent okay. Sound. Yeah, it's based out of Nashville now. Okay. Um, but we did, we had set up a platform where we had traveled and recorded churches that you've never heard of across the country. And we literally went church to church for, gosh, like five years. This was the the bulk of our, I think we wow. did 150 records the first year and a half. Wow. And just churches and the whole mission was about grassroots, local songs, local sounds, local artists, people that you've never heard of just going like, Hey, your, your sound matters. 
and mm-hmm. your voice matters. And so we wanted to give a voice to that. And, uh, you know, I'm a musician and I was a worship leader, but I'm not, that's not like my sweet spot. I'm really a business guy. And yeah. so that was, you know, my partner was really more in the music industry. Mm-hmm. I was on the business side and we just built that thing out and still doing records today. It's evolved a lot. Um, but, uh, that was early on what brought us to Reading. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now. Um, your, your group is called dead presidents club. Okay. Yeah. And what, what, like, what is the, the, the purpose and what are you guys doing? What's the vision for dead presidents club? Yeah. I mean, our slogan is that money's not scary. It's just a bunch of dead presidents and our hope uh, when we set out to, to, it's actually been a passion of mine for a long time, but it had some conflict with my banking career, Mm -hmm. um, to be able to help people break out of their financial cycles, to get financial education. You know, I really believe that nobody has a money problem. They have an, a, a knowledge problem, it's an true. understanding problem and a people problem. Yep. And so part of what we set out to do was just to create a space where um, no shame, no judgment, no weirdness. Like, let's just talk about money and let's just compare notes and let's pull the, you know, let's pull the the weirdness off of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but being that I'm heavily involved in the real estate space, it very quickly became a real estate emphasis. Yep. Uh, and so we've really, I think, you know, I hate to say that we found our niche because I don't know, you know, strategies evolve. Right. Um, but in this kind of era of the business, we've really kind of become uh, more known as like the creative real estate Mm -hmm. type transactions Mm -hmm. and creating environments where people can go from little or no money at all, trying to figure out how to break out of the paycheck to paycheck cycle into actually building wealth through hard assets such as real estate. And so that's kind of, you know, the, the basis and it's growing or it's only 18 months old. Um, and we're just kind of letting it self define a little bit Mm -hmm. and trying to be helpful and bring value. So, and you guys have a conference coming up. We do October 27th, 28th in Redding, California. It's the Creative Wealth Boot Camp. Um, it's not just real estate, there will be a big real estate emphasis. Um, but we're going to be talking about basically the rules of money according to the rich. Um, I really believe that there's a that the 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 game is rigged in the favor of the people who understand the rules. And so we're just going to talk about what we think those rules are and how we see the game should be played. Yep. Um, And we're also going to invite (laughs) different people to give perspectives that are different. There's people that have perspectives that I don't agree with. um, And there's people that have perspectives that I share. And I think all of it is super valuable to learning how to do money. well. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you're doing. I mean, that was really the heart of, of this Mm -hmm. was, was to help people to, see that the way that they believe about money isn't serving them yeah. or that it could be better because, you know, our industry, you were in the mortgage business, but you're in the banking industry. And we, we both have had, you know, a, a lab where we'll be, we've been able to just sit across the table and talk to people about money. And you just, you see the impact of money on people's lives for you sure. Know? And you hear people say things like, I, you know, I can't afford that. Or, um, you know, that that's great for that guy. Mm-hmm. But that's not something that would work for me, right. you know. And, and then you know, in the church or like my story is, I, I grew up kind of poor relative to America, and I just thought when I was young, if you had l- unlimited money, you would be happy. And obviously, that's not true. Right. Um, and then you know, the church. There's people that think money's evil. So one of the things that I've tried to help a lot of people understand is money. Like you said, it isn't good or bad. It actually is just a measurement of value. Yeah. And becoming wealthy isn't about driving Lamborghinis. If that's your thing, (laughs) great. Lamborghinis are great cars. It's about being able to live your life on your own terms. For sure. And, you know, if someone wants to start a business, if they want to make an investment, if they want to go on a trip, money is oftentimes a limiting factor. If they want to put their kids in a different school in California because they don't like what they're teaching at public schools, it's a limiting factor. And so, and I think people are really catching on to that right now with what's going on in the world. I, I really feel like we're seeing a shift in the mentality where people are saying, we cannot think the way that our parents and their parents thought social security is not security at all. Mm -hmm. And we have to really figure out a different way to do things. Yeah. And we're not playing You're to your point. We're not playing by the same set of rules anymore. Mm -hmm. The system is, is evolved. The environment has evolved and, but also the value systems have evolved. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love what you just said. I say this all the time. Financial freedom is not a number to me. No, it's financial freedom is a, is I get to do what I want 
when I want, how I want. It's three o'clock on a Friday and I'm hanging out with my friends doing a podcast. Yep. Like that's freedom to me. Yeah. And the cool part about that is now I take all of the weirdness off of going like, I've got to get X millions of dollars to be financially free to going like, what do I actually value? Mm -hmm. Like what matters to me? And I want to go after those things. And so like for my, I joke, my brother-in-law, who's just an outdoorsman, free spirit surfer loves, just loves adventure in life. Like financial freedom to him would probably be like five grand a month passive while he surfs the Baja peninsula. Sounds pretty good to me. Sounds great. (laughs) It doesn't sound super good to me though, because I like JW Marriott's and steak dinners. So like my, you know, my number is probably a little bit different, but it doesn't make me more, more, my freedom more uh, successful. It just, I, I know what I value. Yeah. And so, and I think you're right though. We have to realize that the game is changing. The economy is changing. And I think you're ultimately, I think we are seeing that because people are looking at the lives of their parents and their grandparents and they're going, it, I love you. I honor you, but it didn't work for you the way you thought. Why would I do what you did? Right. And that's not a dishonoring question. That's nope. just a real question yep. to go. I got to look at this thing differently now. Yeah. And people have to learn it. You know, one of the things that I, I think is very cool about what you're doing, we were just talking about this earlier with Josh. Um, you know, we, I was just golfing this morning and I don't golf very often. It's just like <laughs> to hang out with friends. And I'm not very good. And I sat there and had to tell myself, I was like, you know what? What makes you think you're going to be good at this? You don't know what you're doing, right? And and I think one of the problems when it comes to wealth creation for people is there's a few. You know, number one is they, I think they overestimate how fast they can get there and they don't have a long term. Like if you hit some quick wins, we're going to get back to that in a second because I think that's one of the reasons why real estate's important. For sure. but the, the other thought is these are skills you have to learn Yep. and nobody found themselves sitting in a really financially secure place. Like they dedicated themselves to going to conferences, to reading books and to getting a ton of skills and then finally taking that first risk and, and, you know, trying to minimize it as much as possible because when you start, you don't have a whole lot. I remember the first, um, so I invested for the first time in a, like a professional mastermind, like mentorship type environment. Mm-hmm. I spent a lot of money to get into the program. I did it because I knew, and I was already by most people's standards, financially successful, yeah. right? I had a strong corporate background, right. good income, blah, blah, blah. But when I pivoted fully hard into the real estate investing space, mm-hmm. I knew I needed more knowledge, but I also needed more people. And the first, I the way that I did it is I shopped a couple of different like programs by going to their events. Yep. And I sat, they did a breakout and I was sitting at a table and they did this breakout and they put us at like little tables to do this exercise. And first thing, everybody goes around and they want to introduce themselves and say what they're, what type of investing they do. And I'm the, I somehow ended up being the last guy. So the first guy goes and he's like, I'm such and such. I do this. My portfolio is 15 million. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. That's yep. bigger. That's bigger than me. Yep. Next guy. Yeah, I do a, a multifamily development. I think our portfolio just broke 50 million and like, and they're, t- and now I'm like, okay, I thought we were, I thought that was a one-off and like they go around and one of the guys had like $150 million yeah. portfolio. They get to me and I literally was like, Hey guys, I think I might be at the wrong table. Like mm-hmm. I got a couple million in real estate and I thought I was cool until I sat down right here. Yep. Um, but what was amazing about it was instead of doing the exercise we were supposed to do for the next hour and a half, these five or six multi, multi, multi millionaires, real estate guys doing what I wished that I should, that I could be doing. Yeah spent their time pouring their knowledge and their experience and their ideas into me. And I went, it, that's when it really clicked for me. When I went, this is really about people and knowledge. It's and all about it. It's just the transfer like, of knowledge. How do I get around yeah. people? And the thing that was so cool is like, these guys wanted to give me value. I oh, didn't yeah. even have to ask them for it. They, it's just like this inherent, like they needed to like help people me. People love people that have money, love helping people learn how to make money a thousand percent and And the problem is is a lot of people won't ask 
No. And the, because they're afraid or because they have, they're insecure. I had a very similar experience uh, to you, I, except I was the guy that shared my numbers first, uh, which is worse. That is uh, <laughs> because you would have been confident, right? I was confident. <laughs> and by the time it got around to me, by the time it went all the way around the table, I felt so insecure. But man, good for you and good for me that I kept hanging around those people. Yep. And I got to know them and I realized there is nothing different about them than me, except they have more skills and they've been applying those skills longer. And do you text those guys still? Oh, they're some of my closest friends today. This is the crazy part is like, now I'm getting into trouble in my business. Like we all do, right? I run yeah. into roadblocks. I get it. Yeah. And like these, these multi multi-millionaire guys that have been through all of this stuff, I just pick up the phone and text them. Yep. And what's a panic attack for a week for me is just like a quick, like, oh yeah, just do this for yep. these guys. Yep. And so it's <laughs> super fun. I think it's Zig Ziglar that says, uh, you can have anything you want in life if you just provide enough value to enough people to yep. get what they want. It's so true. And I'm just like, I've experienced that. Yep. And so now like what you're doing with, with Money Hole, what I'm doing, like that's what I want to see is it's like, we're just going to give people yep. value and they get to decide what they do with it, but it's going to, ultimately it's going to serve our our mission. I mean, it already is, man. It's, yeah, for sure. it, you know, it's, it's, it's just... It's one of those things where we don't do it to monetize it, but it always, everything usually always will materialize, mm -hmm. although it's not the, the beginning agenda, you know? Yeah. I mean, I even know what this was going to be when we started and Fab and I were talking about it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to your point, like I had a problem today that I was dealing with and I got off the golf course and I called my friend Rick and my friend Rick has like $110 million. And <laughs> I literally didn't even think about that till you just said that because I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm into this. He's been my friend a long time. Yeah. I don't even think about what he has, but it was a seven minute conversation. I gave him my problem. I respect guys like that's time for sure. And he said, ask me this. And I asked him, he said, this is what you do. And it's like, you know, to have those types of friends, is so invaluable. And so I think the takeaway for people is if you know people that are actually doing things and making things happen, just start spending time with them and understand that they love to help people. And I think a lot of it is that we've been there and yeah. it's just, it's almost this intrinsic uh, responsibility that we want to give the information that was given so freely to us. We're for not sure. special. I mean, I can't speak for you, Michael, but I'm like, a, I'm a very average guy. I just have found a lot of, <laughs> if you're average that I'm below average, that's for <laughs> Dude, sure. I take pride in that, man. Yeah, it's part I, of what too. I try to tell people is like, look, I'm not that smart. I barely graduated high school, man. It's like, you don't actually, you don't got to go to, in fact, today, you know, going to college can actually probably mess you up more than anything. Yeah. Well, that's so. a topic maybe for another podcast. I don't know, but I agree with you, man. And I'm in the same boat. And I mean, I make it a now a discipline. So one of our core values as a family that has become a core value of our business is that a culture of generosity will always pay for itself. Mm. And it's this idea that we don't give to get. And like as Christians, we understand this reaping and sowing. Yep. But just in humanity, there's a magnetic attraction to generosity. Yeah. And I don't, it's yep. not the motive it's, I, no. we're not, you're not doing this so you can, you know, yes, there's marketing. Yes. There's good business. Yes. There's these things. But at the end of the day, people are attracted to what they feel is authentically given to them. Yep. And so now I make it like one of my disciplines yep. is I literally make at least a day a week where I go out to lunch, coffee, or dinner with somebody who messaged me on Instagram mm -hmm. or Facebook or whatever that mm -hmm. wanted help. And I buy them, I buy them their meal and I answer every question they have. Yep. And that's just a discipline now for me to go. I, I don't need anything from that. Yeah. I just want that to be a part of my ecosystem, yep. you know? And I think the more, the more that I've done that, the, the obvious part is the more we've grown, the yep. richer I've become, the, like all of this stuff happens. And the core value is that that type of generosity will just always pay for itself. So tell me a, tell me a story about somebody that you have seen really turn their life around financially. Um, you know, hmm. cause I'll tell you, you know, for me, I can think of a few, unfortunately, a lot of people, they burn out too fast because there's a, there's this men, it does take work and it takes commitment and, you know, anything worth having is it's not going to happen fast. And a lot of times things happen faster, not worth having. So, yeah, uh, you know, there's not a lot that I can count on. I may be on one hand, but the ones that do, it's like, it's so inspiring. So 
Yeah, I'm a big fan. And this is probably a cop out in a sense, because I, I'm a bigger fan of of people that are sti- that are sticking in the hard journey mm-hmm. than I am of like the success stories. Me too. And so there's like, I'm thinking of like, there's guys that, you know, are 40, 50 years old that have never bought a house that we've helped get into home ownership. There's people that have, you know, been hundreds of thousands in credit card debt. Like I can think of those, those stories that you want to celebrate. Yeah. But I had lunch with a guy the other day who I've been just, just as a friend, I've just been helping. I don't do coaching and finance, but as a friend, I've been helping. And the last time I talked to him, um, I just, I was, I just leveled with him and I was like, listen, man, the biggest tension you're having is that you're refusing to pay yourself first. Right. And guys, you know, we understand most people that are in the investor space, they understand what that means, but the common person has no idea. And so I just walked him through the simple idea Mm -hmm. of when money comes into your ecosystem, are you giving it first to the bill collectors, the rent, the mortgage, the car payment, or are you carving off a portion of that to go towards your asset value? You're paying yourself first and then you're chopping that up. And it just as a discipline. And I'm not talking about, you know, being able to go out and buy a, you know, an apartment building with that. I'm just talking about the discipline of going, Mm -hmm. if you're not paying yourself first, then the banks are making money. The debt collectors are making money. Your money's not working for you. It's working for them. This was probably two or three months ago. And I said, Hey, I need you to go back, chronicle your expenses. Mm -hmm. Look at, look at the money that you spent and don't look at it through this regret, shame, a shoulda, woulda, coulda lens. Look through it as this is the lifestyle that I organically created, right? This is without any plan. This is what my behaviors told me I valued. And then look at it objectively from that perspective and go, what what of these things have really provided me long-term value or more gratification and make decisions not based upon the regret, but based upon being empowered by the fact that you know what, what, what you valued. And so we had this whole conversation. I gave him an exercise and I just had lunch with him last week. And he's like, he's like the craziest thing for me is that every time I get paid, every time I get an extra buck, every time this happens, the first thing I think about is how can I carve it off and put it away? How can I carve it off and put it away? And I think he, you know, he said, he's got like several hundred, not a high income earning person. Sure. He's got seven, six, seven hundred dollars in this account. And I'm like, to me, those are the success stories that I love because I he's not there yet. And he's not buying the asset and investing and building his portfolio, but he's making the decisions that are going to be foundational yeah. to set him up and his family up for long-term success. Yeah. And he said this to me, he said, before we met last, I was convinced that I would never be out of this financial cycle that my financial life would always be the same. Yep. I have $700 in the bank, which he knows is not a lot of money. And I feel more hope than I've ever felt before. That's it. I mean, that's everything, right? I think that when people commit to the process of getting out of debt and accumulating wealth, the point at which they are convinced that this is the path and they become hopeful. For me, like once I can get someone to that point where they're not going to turn back, then they're, they've already made it, right? Yeah. At that point, it's just keeping score and look at the numbers. I was doing a financial freedom workshop yesterday because I've had so many people reaching out to me, um, clients, friends, people. I mean, people have been coming out of the woodwork because of what's going on in the economy, asking me what to do about their problems. So we had a, a lot of people on and I was going over a personal family budget. Of course, before the budget, I told them, listen, the budget's only gonna take you so far. Right. You have to figure out how to increase your income. But I told them, I said, listen, if you just do this budget for six months, it will change the way you think. Mm-hmm. It will change your behavior. It's like, it's like stepping on the scale and counting calories. You're going, if you committed to doing that for an extended period of time, you're going to lose weight even if you didn't plan on it because you become aware of what you're actually taking in. And, and so I think that the important thing for people, like you said, with this guy is to start to get that awareness. I have, I've had a couple clients this year who have sat down with me to get pre-approved to buy a house. And one of the things that they say is, you know, we don't want to be house rich and cash poor. <laughs> and this one couple, I said, okay, I understand that. Let me ask you a couple of questions. How much does it take to keep the lights on? What's your survival number? Well, they said, well, what's up? What do you mean our survival? What do you mean? I said, okay, well, what does your personal family budget look like? And they both looked at each other. Obviously they don't do one. And I said, well, 
let's do this. Why don't you take the last three months bank statements, credit card statements, and account for every single dollar that's going out of your house and figure out what are the things that are important and what are the things that are not, and then come back to me and let's have this conversation about a mortgage payment again, because we're more expensive right now. Yep. I get it. And and they did it and they came back and I said, so the question really isn't about being house rich and cash poor. In fact, you may be better off being house rich and cash poor because right now it, you're just poor. Right. And you don't have to be. Yep. I said, you know, in many ways, having that higher mortgage, it's it's probably going to be better for you. It's kind of a forced savings account. They ended up going on to buy a house. And, and so I think that people, you know, the first step is, and this is something we teach people, is just to start tracking everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's on its own, it's not going to make you wealthy. Sure. You have to be able to raise your income. There's lots of ways to do that right now. Well, and I think that just not to interject, but no, like I it. think that the brilliance of of the going back and chronicling yep. is it's not shame based budgeting no. that says I'm supposed to set a number that I'm supposed to hit and then inevitably being frustrated by the fact you didn't. It's looking at your life through the lens of empowerment and going, yeah. This is what I that this is what I told my bank I valued. Yep. And for me, I say this all the time. I don't know if you agree, some do, some don't, but to me it's much easier to earn another five hundred bucks a month than it is to shave it from my budget. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so like the avenue of this is going like, Hey, now you've got a choice. You need to make up 500 bucks a month in your budget. You can either go to less Starbucks, which I this that's your prerogative, or you can figure out how to make another $500, but now you get to choose. It's not, we're not hammering in. You shoulda, woulda, coulda. Nobody has saved their way to financial freedom. Yeah. It is learning how to make this stuff work for them. Totally. It's like that, a quote that I shared recently, Dave, Dave Ramsey's worth $200 million. He did not get that from doing a personal family budget and cutting up his credit card bills. He did that from selling you the program on how to do that. Yeah. Right? I, you're, and I'm not trying to dog on him. He did course. it through creating a business and creating value. And I, and no hate for how he got there. See, you're kinder than me. The way I've said it is it. Uh, the way that I've said it is, <laughs> is that Dave didn't get rich by putting money in envelopes. He got it rich by selling books to poor people. Yeah. And so like, to me, I, again, we joke about it. It gets great clicks the Dave lovers come out, the Dave haters come out. Yep. The truth is, is Dave's a brilliant man. He is. He's but, a great business man. And, and he's helped millions of people. And tons of his advice is rock solid. Right. And we can get on board with all of that. Yeah. But Dave Ramsey's plan will not build generational wealth. Well, and I want to talk about that. So you talked about raising the $500. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And and 70% of what I told my friends and clients on this financial freedom workshop was around making more money. And I think it, and I, and it was my first time really doing this in an organized format. So I think it comes down to a couple things. I think number one, um, people need to learn how to think outside the box right now. Yep. Number two, they need to be open to getting additional certifications, going to online courses and spending a little bit of money to educate themselves, which, you know, is the best money you'll ever invest. And then number three, I think negotiation skills are super important, it's true. you know, cause like, like for me, an employer in California, I've got tons of friends that are employers. If you have a great person that works for you, you, they kind of have you by the short hairs. Mm -hmm. And if they came up to you and I tell my clients this all the time, who don't think they can get a raise, I said, let me give you some advice. Go to your employer. Tell them that you're renting and your rent keeps going up and it has for the last 10 years. You have two kids and you want to keep raising your family in Reading, but you can no longer afford to be renting and you need to buy a house. But because of home prices and rates, it's pretty expensive right now. And the only way it's going to work is if you can get a raise of whatever it is. I understand that this is probably not great timing. I'm willing to bring value to you. And here's some things I think I can do to help you make more money. Would you just think about it for a week and let me know? Because we really think we need to buy a house right now. Every single person I've said that to has been able to negotiate a, a raise. But so many people don't know how to negotiate. Yeah. And so I really think that there's so much that people can do right now. In fact, a lot of the guests we've had, we've talked about, it's easier to make more money right now than ever in history. And, and if someone's listening to this and they don't believe that, I'm telling you, you're wrong. Yeah, agreed. I just don't, I mean, you have to look at it objectively. I mean, the speed to revenue just through technology is insane. Like there's, it's unprecedented. Mm -hmm. It is 
absolutely the easiest time in in human history to make money through your cell phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, guys like Gary V and some you know like him, love him, hate him, whatever. That he's you know been famously screaming this for a long time. Yeah. Like, if you need to make another thousand dollars a month, the and you can't figure it out, like go YouTube, make a thousand dollars a month, and you're going to figure it out really quickly. It's out there. It's out there, yeah. and it and it's not sexy. That's really what it comes down to. Is, is that it's not always sexy to figure that out. But we're not really looking for sexy. We're looking for longevity. We're looking for legacy. We're yep. looking for something that matters. And, and once you get into that path and you start figuring these things out, you're usually going to stumble onto something that's a real winner, but you're not going to find those opportunities until you're on that highway looking for them. And I think a lot of it comes down to what the fact that we let money drive us in incorrectly we let because so much so much about money is tied up in fear right mm, and and or so, greed or greed which honestly to me is just masquerading it's it's the same thing masquerading as different banners it really right? is and so i just go like my motive if if my if my money is my boss then the money's in control of my actions mm -hmm. but if i if i don't work for my money and I'm learning to make my money work for me. Now I have control. I can get out from under fear and I can start to make decisions that will change the trajectory for me. And I let, I've gotten to a point because you've been there. Anybody who's a business owner has been there. Like I got money stress. Yeah. Just like everybody else. Yep. My, my zeros might be a little bit longer on the check, but it's stressful. The emotions are the same. They're the, and one of my mentors said that to me one time, I was like, when does this stop? Never. Like, when does this stop? And he goes, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. The numbers just keep getting bigger. The, the dependency people depending on you just gets, gets more. And, and I just realized like, if I can learn to repurpose the stress that has been fear of lack or fear mm -hmm. of not paying or fear of whatever into creativity to solve problems changes everything. Yeah. It's uh, to a fault. Sometimes I now find it's almost become like a little bit of a game to me. It's like, I almost set myself up to have to solve money problems that I wouldn't have to, you know, have to solve if I was just a little more conservative or a little bit more this. And, but it's true. Like that urgency, uh, and the pressure of needing to provide and show up and pay the bills and pay payroll and do mm -hmm. these things that can drive you into anxiety, fear, like panic, or it can drive you into creativity, into innovation, and ultimately into wealth building. Yeah, I agree. And you know, people listen to this, and I, you know, you might be thinking because I would probably have thought this at one point. You know, that sounds like a lot of work. And <laughs> you know what a lot of work is? Ending up in your sixties with not <laughs> a pot to piss in, and trying to figure out how you're going to stop working because your back hurts and you're not sleeping good, and you're on medication, and you're not convinced your government can take care of you anymore. That's a lot of work. It's the reality of the majority of the boomer and Gen Z yep. environment. Mm -hmm. like, And it's sad, and it's hard, because they were told and sold a mechanism that worked for their parents or their grandparents that does not trickle down because the cost of the, the uh, uh, inflation of incomes is not keeping up with the inflation of the economy. Right. And so there's just, there comes a point where we have to start having conversations and going, and honestly, I will say this part of why people don't invest in their knowledge is because gurus have, have ruined them into not trusting any of the knowledge that's out there. It's true. So I, you know, I agree with you. If, if I could start all over again, if I had 5,000 bucks and I was starting all all over again, I'd go blow it on an e-course. That's for sure. Yep. But the problem is, is that I, how do I know even what e-course to go blow it on? 90% of them are guys who don't actually have any money. It's trash. Yep. And so I, I do agree with that, but there's this reality of going, we have to learn how to do it different. Yep. And I have to accept that I might have to wade through five trashy gurus mm -hmm. to finally get the thing that changes yep. my life. Yep. And that sounds, it's, you know, it's funny. I say this stuff and then people on the comments will go, well, so where do I go to buy your e-course, you know, Mr. Guru, I don't even sell an e-course. Like yeah. this is the point yeah. is I go, go find one yeah. that feels like it's going to give you what you need to yeah. be successful. And at the end of the day, like that's going to change your life. I know so many people who are incredibly wealthy, who have a very similar story that they were broke. They were anxious. Their life was totally out of balance. 
um, super broken on the inside and the out. And one of their one of the things they did was they stumbled onto a community where they saw that they were the fruit of it, like a coaching community, an e-course community. And they literally had heart. They didn't even have enough money. One of my friends told me I didn't even have enough money to take an Uber from the airport to the uh, hotel. He's like, I literally had to find someone and jump in their Uber with them. My credit cards were maxed up when I showed up. And, and I just think it's important that people hear that because it, the, if someone tells you about an easy way to, to get to this financial independence, run from it. So let's get kind of practical. Um, you talked about paying yourself first. I agree with that. I, the millionaire next door was a man who worked at UPS. I have a lot of clients who started with me on a teacher's salary. Now, was he a UPS driver though? Because I hear they make it, like 200 grand a year now. It, well, this was not when they made that much. This was a guy <laughs> who lived on, you know, basically a little bit more than a teacher's salary. Yeah. And he saved 20% of his paycheck for 20 years and had multiple millions of dollars because of compound interest. So we follow a very simple model, 30, 30, 30, 10 rule. And so it's not perfect depending on your tax bracket or what state you live in, but 30% you live on, 30% goes to the IRS, um, 30, and then you know 10% to God. And you want to try to save 20 to 30% of your income every month for 20 years. Um, if someone can get to a place to do that, they will become a millionaire. If you're investing in the right things at real estate, you know, dividend paying blue chip stocks and that sort of thing. And I talk to people, they're like, well, I can't, how, how could I ever get to that? I say, well, you're not going to get to that overnight, but if you commit to a process and you just keep working at it, your income will go up, your debt will go down and you will get there. Yeah. So what are some practical things that you would tell people right now? Well, I mean, I'll tell you this, and this is just me being honest. Like I haven't had a budget in a decade. So like I'm the wrong guy to ask about like the practical finance. Well, rules, just anything you know. else for um, someone that's like middle class, yeah, 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 yeah. paycheck no. to paycheck right now yeah. wants to be where you're at. For sure. I'm not saying that because I don't think budgets are good. I'm just simply saying that because there does come a point where you learn the skills and you, it, it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? right? You can't keep up with even the plan. And so um, practically for me, I, I prescribe to, th- to idea, simple principles like paying myself first, right? Anytime money comes into my ecosystem, it goes into an asset account, period. And those numbers, I, you know, obviously I need to, to account for, I still have to pay my bills. Mm-hmm. But what a lot of people do is they let money come into their ecosystem. They pay all of their bills. They dump what's left over on their credit card to pay it down. And the problem is, is that they've still got incidentals. Mm-hmm. So they end up just swiping the card, you know, running the card back up and then they do it again next payday. And so for me, um, one of the, you know, controversial thoughts of the day is like, if you really want to break out of like a cycle of credit card debt, you've got to first realize that you've got to learn the discipline of paying yourself first. Even if that means that you've got to carry a little bit of that debt for a season. And this is where, you know, the, 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 the the pay debt off guys really have a panic attack. The fastest way to pay off debt is to not pay it off. The fastest way to pay off debt is to learn the discipline to build the discipline of building assets that pay for liabilities. So practically like that might start with a $50, a paycheck carve off. I don't care about the number. I just care about the discipline and learn learning how to, how to pay me. Mm -hmm. And then that way, when inevitably in life, that lump sum comes in, or you get that raise, or you, uh, a a, uh, mentor said to me early on, he says, you'll never, he was trying to teach me to, you know, to, to, to be balanced as I grew my career. But he said to me, you'll never out earn stupid. He (laughs) says, you'll never out earn stupid. And thankfully I've proven that theory wrong a number of times, but, uh, (laughs) but it's true. It's like, it's the lifestyle creep and learning to pay myself first limits that lifestyle yep. creep because yep. I'm thinking first about investing. Yep. So that's one principle, pay myself first. It's really practical. Um, another practical, the way we teach our students is through this concept of make, manage, multiply. And the concept is that I, you first need to develop a skill or a set of skills that achieve what what would be considered to you a large consistent income, right? For some, I we we I believe that in California it's two hundred thousand bucks. Yep. Like at the end of, at the end of the day, you need to if you want to live okay in California, you need to make two hundred thousand dollars. And if your job isn't paying you two hundred thousand dollars, then you need to learn a skill that can either supplement or replace 
with two hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Because once I learn that skill, and for our students, it's real estate, right? They can learn how to wholesale. They can learn how to be bird dogs. They can become, you know, real estate agents, mortgage. Like there's different things that they can do. Um, to grow that skill. Once they learn how to make it, then they can learn how to manage it through investing, through growth. And ultimately that's where multiplication yeah, comes from. Yeah. So I would say for me, like two really practical functions is learn the discipline of paying yourself first and then ultimately invest, whether it's money or time or whatever, invest in a skill that generates a a large income so that you can ultimately reallocate that yeah. into something that matters. And I know that sounds easier said than done, but it's also not as hard as you think it is. It's not. And nothing worth having this type of freedom that you're talking about where we can sit here at three o'clock on a Friday is going to be easy. No, um, But I promise you it is the easier, softer way over a 60 year life. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, my father-in-law, I love him. He's a, he's, and they've been brilliant with their money. He was a pastor. He was a youth pastor for 30 years. Uh, and just you, I mean, youth pastoring, you know, they don't make a lot of money, right? right? Youth pastoring for 30 years, painting houses on the side. This guy's done a vacation a year for his family since the, since they were married, they bought a lake home as of like a cabin, a lake, you know, family home. But like, you know, they've done really well financially, but now he's coming to the point in his life. He's no longer pastoring and he doesn't want to pastor anymore. And they, but they're not fully prepared for retirement. And so now he's back on painting and construction and he's 65 years old and he's having these questions. Yep. And this is a guy who's done well with what he's had yep. and he's hurting and he's tired. And, and so we look at that and I go, now, luckily he's got family that's going to help bridge this thing for him. But a lot of people don't. Don't. And so we have to become those bridges. You know, for people listening to this in closing here, this is a, a good thought to think about. Uh, if you're someone who is really resonating with this or this is triggering you, um, <laughs> this is a really hard question that I have been asking myself and that I really think is good for people to think about. When it comes to your kids, you are either going to become a blessing or a burden. And the choices that we make right wow. now with everything you just heard, are going to equal what that result is going to be. So, Michael, thanks for so much for coming, bud. Hey, thanks for it's having me. It's been a great conversation, man. Super good. Have a great day. You too.